All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to look at two major things. They are quite broad. So as I indicated, watch the other videos. One is correlation. The other is regression. Let's look at them because they are two separate things. Okay. Correlation is association between two variables. The relationship between a man and a woman is correlation. The relationship between price and quantity demanded is correlation. It can be strong, it can be weak. It can be positive, it can be negative. For example, the relationship between consumption and income is positive because once your income goes up, your consumption goes up. But between price and quantity is negative. But it's saying it's positive, it's negative. It doesn't make a big thing except when you calculate it. So if you look at the relationship on your screen, is it positive or negative? The link that you see, you can type the answer there. Okay, you see the words, the symbol for positive and the symbol for negative. You can leave that. So the relationship you see on your screen, get used to charting, eh? So let's look at it. If I want to measure the correlation, I can use a percentage value. The closer it is towards 100 percent, that is strong. The closer it is towards zero, that is very, very negative, uh, very weak. But the value itself is between zero and one. So is zero and one positive or negative? So please note that. So if I say that there's a strong relationship, the best way to prove that is by the link. We use a correlation coefficient, the Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient. But normally, in order to not be bothered much about the strength, don't focus on the sign. Don't focus on the sign. So what this means is that you can have a Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient. One is negative. 0.9. The other is 0.8. Which one is showing strong relationship? It is a one that is negative 0.9. It's not a one that is positive. So the negative doesn't make it bad. It just shows that the relationship is negative. And if something, you see, sometimes some people use the word negative in the morality sense. No, negative, as if it's bad. But negative doesn't mean bad. The relationship between price and quantity demanded is negative. But it doesn't mean it's bad. Look at the relationship on your screen. The first one on the top left, the relationship between X and Y is what? The one on your top left, the relationship between X and Y, positive or negative? O or ne You can see that as things are increasing from 0 to x, they are also increasing from 0 to y. Okay. So on the x and the y axis, when one is going up, the other is going up. But look at the picture below. When y is coming down, x is going up. And so that is negative. The one on the top right is quadratic relationship. Certain things that rise gets to the top and then falls. And the last one is complex. It's like a logistic curve or logit or product. So correlation tells you relationship. But what about regression? Regression tells you something about causality. You see, regression tells you that it's not just that the, the relationship is positive or negative. It's not that when one is going up, the other is also going up. But what is causing one to go up? Regression is causality. Correlation is association. Regression is a, rela is a, a causal relationship. A correlation is a relationship. So note that. Okay, note that. Okay. So I'm going to give you some kind of regression. There's a simple regression and there's a multiple regression. The 
regression that you are seeing here, the sample regression, it shows the relationship between y and x. The one which is inside on the right hand side, the x's, they are known as the independent variable. And the one on the left, they are known as the dependent variable. And sometimes the independent variables will be plenty. So in the multiple regression, you see that A, B, C, D, E, all of them are independent variables. And there's always only one dependent variable. Sometimes in a limited dependent variable regression, there could be two or more dependent variables. I will not study that one. Now, inside, in front of every independent variable, there's a beta parameter. These this BBB, they are called betas, the betas, the betas. And when you go to the sample regression tool, we have the betas. What does the beta mean? The beta tells you how much the independent variable is affecting the dependent variable. So you have an independent variable, which is X here, which is A here, which is B here. Everybody claims to be affecting the dependent variable. Why? Is it true? Are they really doing that? So for how much? Because if B claims that, oh, I'm affecting it big time. A will also say, I'm affecting it big time. But how much? The beta parameter, if you look at the beta one, if the beta one value is 40, and then the beta two value is 70, then we can say that B is affecting the Y, the dependent variable, by more than the A because the beta is 70, whereas the A's beta is actually 40. So the beta parameters tells you by how much, and these things that I'm saying, you just write them down, because that is how you come to understand it later. So if you want to explain why, if you want to look at the behavior of why, okay, look at, the way A, B, C, D are behaving. That's it. Look at the way they are behaving. And that is important. So it means that this A, B, C, D, they are known as the explained. They are the one explaining the behavior of the, of the Y. They are called explanatory variables. And they are explaining the Y, which is the explained. So we have the explanatory and then explain. In all of this, I've not mentioned the UI. The UI. The name for the UI, and when you look at the notes, you see this thing. The UI is known as the random noise. The random noise. It used in practical. It has several names. Unobserved heterogeneity. Stochastic noise. Okay. Error term. White noise. Disturbance term. And things like that. In short, it is not observed. I can collect data for A, B, C, D, but I will not be able to collect data for UI because you don't observe it. And yet, behind the scenes, it is it is probably affecting the dependent variable. And so, the whole essence of regression is to minimize that thing, that error, and cause it to go down to a value of zero. Okay, and that is it. Okay, for a person to be able to move ahead and do that. Now, the best way to understand a regression is take a practical example, because this A, B, X, and these things can, can be confusing. Eh? So let's get practical. Let's get practical, because in real life is what we can bring into a model like this. Let's take a typical example, and you are going to answer some of them for me. The wage, your salary, is affected by your education. That is why education is one of the independent variables here. Experience, your position, your ability. All of them affect your wage. But of course, there are other factors that also affect your wage, but these factors have not been captured in here. They are all inside the error term. The error term. Who can tell me some of the factors that can affect wage, but have not been captured here? Reasonable factors, relevant. Now, I will determine whether it's relevant or not. So type for me one factor that you think can affect the wage, your salary, but it hasn't been captured yet. Apart from education, experience, position, 
and ability. What factor? Exposure, that's too broad. Gender, no. Company success, no. I will tell you which factor is relevant because some of the factors you say, you can't even count them. They are not. Over time, I'll buy that. Emma, that's an excellent question. App, appraiser, no. Location, yes. Inflation can affect. Okay. Inflation affects everybody, so it's not relevant. Cost of living, no. Okay. Yeah, but over time and location are good. Hours of work, everything goes into hours of work. Rent is relevant. Don't worry, I will tell you what is relevant and what is not relevant. Okay. If you mention hours of work, that's the beginning. Okay. Expected salary will affect your current salary. I kind of agree. I kind of agree. Salary expectations. Okay. Demand and supply of labor, no. That in the first place is what determines the wage in the first place. Okay. Anyway. Company profit margin, company productivity, no, no, no. Because everybody gets into that. Okay. But basically, over time, I wanted something like Rex or the type of industry. Because Rex or the type of industry can determine the wage. Over time is good. Location is good. Okay. Now let's look at another model. The blood pressure of a person is affected by the age, the weight. The stress, the pulse, your blood pressure can affect. Nobody should mention broken heart. Broken heart doesn't lead to blood pressure. So for 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 one of the unobserved factors, the disturbances, the errors. What other factors can affect blood pressure, which is contained in the error term here, but have not been captured in the independent error? What do you think? What other factors? No broken heart. Medical condition, other diseases, fine. Genetic is fine. Pregnancy, okay. So other diseases, genetic pregnancy, diet is excellent. Okay. Diet. Everything that gets into your body is a diet. What else? There's one more that has not come. One more. One more. What other factors can affect the blood pressure aside what you've typed? There's one particular one I'm looking for. It's common. It's easy. Okay. No, sleep is out. Temperament is out. Lifestyle is out. It is exercise. Exercise. Okay. Somebody says broken heart. What broken heart? Okay. If you're going to break your heart, it's, that's not what leads to your blood pressure. Okay. Your blood pressure was already there. Okay. So exercise, yeah? Diet, genetic, all of that. They can affect your blood pressure. Your ability to be able to identify other factors are important. Working hours, no. Working hours does not affect your blood pressure. Even over time, that if you love your work, eh, if you love the work you are doing, you can do 16 hours a day and it will not affect your pressure level. Okay. It is the jobs you do that you don't like. They are the ones that eventually, even two hours of that, you're angry. Then you, you get blood pressure. So jobs and more hours doesn't lead to death. Stress is already inside the list, and so you can't mention stress again. Okay, let's go to the next one. The quantity demanded of a product is affected by the price of the product, the, the income, okay, the income we indicate whether the good is a normal good or inferior good, the advertisement, whether the good is a substitute or a complement. Okay, what other factors are? Captured. Nobody should mention taste and preferences. Nobody should mention taste and preference. What other factors can lead to impact on demand, but have not been captured here, like price, complement price, income, advert, and all that? What other thing? Nobody should mention taste and preference. Joseph, please stop pri private messaging me, okay? It's not helpful. You can stay. There's no need to keep repeating yourself. Availability, no. Other substitutes, I've already mentioned other substitutes. Scarcity of goods, no. Scarcity of goods, no. Uh, what else? Political intervention, no. How can you bring this? Advertising, I just mentioned advert, and you also mentioned advertising. Product quality is difficult to measure, so I'll draw. First one is population. Okay, population. Is 
greater the population, the greater the demand. That is one. Price expectation. Price expectation can also affect demand. What else? There's more. There's more. Somebody will even mention location. Seasonality is fantastic, Araba. That's an excellent answer. Seasonality. Seasonality. Okay. So the goods will increase its demand because of seasonality. That's perfectly fine. What else? Okay. Location, occupation, religion, all of this can affect demand. Okay. Depending on the kind of good you are talking about. All right. Now look at the last one. The last one is not a model. It is an equation. It is an estimated equation. It is not a model. The other ones that we looked at is a model. Now I want you to look at the first one, which is like the last one. But there are differences. There are differences between the first one and that of the last one. What are some of the differences you can spot between the first one? And the... There are two main differences between the specified model, which is the first one here, and the estimated regression equation, which is the last one here. There are two main differences. What is it? You can raise your hand if you want, so you can type the answer there. What are the two main differences? Number one, let's see whether somebody got it. No error. No error in the specified or in the estimated. Which one? You have to be clear. Okay. There is no error in the estimated regression equation. So this one, the last one, the bottom one, there is no error term. There is no error term. The first one there is an error term. That's it. And then the second point is that the last one has numerical coefficient. Everything I'm saying, write them down. Okay, it's very important. Okay. The last one has numerical coefficient. You can see the numbers. The numbers. The numbers. The numbers. However, the first one has beta parameters. Okay, beta parameter. Beta parameter. So it's very important to know this, that the estimated equation has no error. Why? Because I told you it's an error. It's an error and you want to expect the errors to go away. You remember I told you that those errors are the unobserved factors. So the relationship between your husband and a wife is observed. But there are other factors behind the scenes that are unobserved to people and these factors can be affecting the relationship. Money. Money. In laws. In laws. They are not observed. They are not critically observed. And no. And these things can affect the relationship. And that is why you want to reduce such factors to zero. So that is why eventually the error term is no more than zero. In the estimated equation, where you have established the link, the error term is zero. Now, the assumptions of regression. I've given in the other video, so you can check it out. But you should know all these um, assumptions of regression. Oh man, you should know them. Linearity, normality, homoscedasticity, okay? No autocorrelation, no high multicollinearity. You should have that. Sometimes no endogeneity. So these assumptions, you should know them and you should know the meanings of them because it's in the other videos there. All of them are taking my time to explain each one of them. Now, let's go to a dummy variable. A dummy variable. Okay. Look at one of the independent variables here. Look at them. Look at them. The independent variables, if you want to actually have them, you have them as numbers. Okay. I'll show you the Brook to Venture data. In fact, let me just use that to explain independent, the dummy variable very you need it right now. Look at this data. What is the first variable? That is Q. That's a quantity demanded. It's numerical number. Now look at the second variable. It's price. Price is numerical. It's not a dummy. A dummy variable is a variable that is static. It doesn't change. At least within a year, the variable is static. It's fixed. A typical example is gender. In reality, within a year, people don't be changing their gender. You are either a man or a woman. 
female or male. No change. Such are dummy variables. Now, gender is a dummy variable. But below gender, when you look under gender, we have something we call levels. The levels are two. Female, male. So every dummy variable has got, you know, some levels. Now, the interesting thing is that the number of dummy variables, the number of dummy variables are always one less than the number of levels. The number of dummy variables are always one less than the number of levels. So if you look at complement price, C, is it a numerical variable or a dummy? Use N for numerical, use D for dummy. If you look at the C, is it numerical or dummy? I mean, that one is obvious, eh? Some people have made up their mind that they're going to talk, which is what I like, okay? Numerical variables, okay? So that's it. What about income, M? Income. Is it a dummy variable or it is numerical? Income. Income. Is it dummy or numerical? Income is numerical. Excellent. Now let's look at location. Location. Is it dummy or it is numerical? Is it dummy? I mean, is it categorical or numerical? Location. Location. Location is D. Excellent. Very good. Now watch something. How many levels does location have? How many levels does location have? Okay. It's obvious. By the time you get to number 11, you've seen it. How many levels does location have? Two. Excellent. Two. So how many dummies should location have? How many dummies should location have? How many dummies should location have? <laughs> the answers are there. Somebody was just confused. One. Excellent. Very good. So the dummy should be one. Let's go to the next one. Occupation. 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 Is it numerical or it is a dummy? Numerical or dummy? N or D? Numerical or dummy? Occupation. Occupation. Wow. Occupation. Is it numerical or dummy? Okay. Somebody is asking why. I will explain very soon. Don't worry. Okay. Occupation. Occupation is a dummy. Okay, good. Now look at it. Occupation is truly dummy. Somebody was asking why. Now, how many dummies do we have here? Well, you will not know the number of dummies, but I told you that the number of dummies are always one less than the number of levels. The number of dummies are always one less than the number of levels. Okay, so you count the levels. Teaching, fashion, another teaching and fashion, so we don't need them. Okay, teaching, fashion, okay, and trading. So it appears that by the time you get to the 10th one, you know the levels. So we have teaching is one of them levels. Fishing is one of them levels. Trading is one of them levels. So there are three levels for occupation. Now, because there are three levels for occupation, how many dummies are we going to expect? How many dummies? How many dummies? I'll show you why we expect that. Two. Excellent. Very good. Now, there's something about dummy called the reference category okay dummy reference category now why is that important well what the software does is that the software will pick the three levels and will automatically select one to be the reference category and what the ref, the, the software will do is that it will choose the one that has alphabetical order first so you see that we have teaching we have fishing, and then we have what? We have trading. Now, when it is selecting which particular one, which particular one is going to give you the reference category, it will select which one. Like I said, in alphabetical order, we choose the one that comes first. And that will be what? Which one comes first? Fishing. Excellent, Araba. You are really participating, eh? And so it's very important. Now, what this means is that if fishing is selected to be the reference category, it will create a dummy for teaching and a dummy for trading. But it will not create any dummy for fishing because fishing is a reference category. Now, what does it mean when we say it's the reference category? It means that anytime I mention teaching, 
I am speaking of teaching relative to the fishing. That's a reference. In reference to fishing. Or anytime I speak about trading, I'm speaking about trading in reference to fishing. So fishing becomes a reference group, the reference category. Now let's go to the last one, religion. Religion. How many levels are... A religion is automatically a categorical dummy variable. Okay, so I won't ask you whether it's dummy or not. How many levels does it have? Religion. How many levels? How many levels does religion have? Religion has three levels. Three levels. Okay, somebody has just counted two. Okay, and the person stopped there. He did not go to the end. The person counted, uh, he didn't come to number 10 and 11. And so the person said two. By three levels. How many dummies do you think he should have? How many dummies should he have? How many dummies? Two dummies. Two dummies. Two dummies. Okay, because the levels are three. So what we are going to do is that we're going to take this data into Excel and then make sense of it. Now watch the next one. This is an important one. Okay. This is an important one. Um, and what I'm going to show you is important because the thing about dummy variables is this. You can code them. You can code them. So in the next Excel sheet, in the next Excel sheet, which most of you will have, you can see that I have now created the levels. Location we indicated that there will be two levels and one dummy. That's it. For occupation, we said there will be two dummies and three levels. So you can see that I've created a dummy for occupation teaching. Okay. Why is it one here? Because in that column, wherever teaching is, I'll code it as one. Wherever teaching is, I'll code it as one. And wherever teaching is not, I'll code it as zero. So wherever you see zero here, it means I wasn't teaching. One means teaching. Zero means it wasn't teaching. So it could be, it could be um, the other occupation, which is, which is trading or fishing. Okay. As long as it's zero, it's not teaching. But when it comes to the next column, the next column is occupation trading tier. I've coded them tier, and you can see that the first one is zero. Because that was what? That was supposed to be trading. Uh, that was supposed to be not trading. Okay. And then on and on. If you look at the religion. Religion, there were three levels. So I've created what? Two dummies. Two dummies. RCRM. RCRM. Now you can take this data into R. But the best R can work with is this very one. Okay. The categorical, the one that comes with English letters. And then Excel can best work for this one. So I'm going to do some few analysis in Excel for you. And I'm going to take you back to the dummy variables that we're looking at. In fact, we looked at all of this. So the dummy variable is sometimes called categorical variable, dichotomous variable, or binary variable. Okay. How you interpret them is important. How you interpret the dummy variable. Please remember, I'll go back to the Excel data. So look at this. In fact, all of these are in the videos that I've explained, the other videos in detail. How do you interpret this? Now, this is an estimated equation. This is an estimated equation. How do you interpret it? Well, don't worry. We'll come to interpret it for you. But you should always note that if it is numerical variable, you interpret the independent variable as rising or falling. Coded as one or zero otherwise. When that is the case, how you interpret a dummy variable? It's not the same as how you interpret um, a numerical variable. Okay, because the dummy variable is not rising and falling. The type of the firm is domestic or foreign. That is not rising or falling. But profit can rise or fall. Assets can rise or fall. So they are numerical. But the type, the type is a dummy variable. Okay. So you will learn how to interpret these things. I'll teach you that. So let's look at the Brukuti data set. I've explained everything about the data set for you, but this story tells you all about the data set. And it also tells you the 
details in fact everything that you see the picture that didn't come is all inside the excel here so he's explaining this data set okay this data set and let's watch some few things he says that the quantity demanded which is a kill the quantity demanded of gin bitters depends on the price of gin the complement price of gin c the income of the people m the location of the shop and that is a dummy variable because he said that where lu is one you see if it is one it means that it's been coded as one okay if the location is urban or zero otherwise and when you read down 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 to the last one it says that religion and it, it mentions all the dominant religions christians muslims buddhists and it says that when rc is one the people are christians or zero otherwise when RM is one, the people are Muslims or zero otherwise. So based on this, you will notice that which one was the reference category? Religion. Looking at religion here, which one would you say was the reference category? Reference category for religion. That one is easy. Because one of them was not used. And the reference category is the one that is always not mentioned. Which one is that? Amanda, that's an excellent answer. Okay, and Jerry. The reference category is Buddhist. It's Buddhist. So there was nothing spoken of for Buddhist. Now, if you look at the occupation there, what was the reference category? What was the reference category for occupation? For occupation. The answer is correct. The answer is fishing. Fishing. Fishing is a reference category. Okay, so with all these in mind, now we are ready to generate a correlation. So when we do a correlation first, then we do a regression. And like I indicated, the correlation, I'm going to do it faster, but you can watch it and repeat it. So the first thing you have to do is you should use this coded data because if you use the one with the letters, English letters, it will not accept it. So you use a numerical data type, this one. How do you do it? First thing you want to do is to go to the data tab at the top okay at the top you see data tab click on the data tab click on it and then on the far right you see data analysis on the far right you see data analysis okay so click on data analysis click on data analysis please don't worry some of you will be lost along the way is normal okay once you click on data analysis a pop-up will show which is known as Correlation. You see, that's a proper. In the list, you see correlation. It is in alphabetical order. Okay. You double click that, a pop up will show. It's known as a correlation dialog box. In the input range, you see the cursor is blinking at the input range. Click there. Once the cursor is blinking, click the first one, the, de the dependent variable. Move it, drag it all the way to the last term there, and then release your hand. Release your hand, and then come and take the labels in first row. Labels in first row. Then take the output range. The labels in first row it will commandeer R that I want you to use the first label in the first year. So the output range. You see the cursor blinking on the white space. Just select anywhere to the right of the last color. Anywhere to the right of the last color. Okay. And then that's where you want the results to be. So the results are going to be shown here. Once you click OK, a correlation matrix will be drawn for you. This is known as a correlation matrix. This is indicating the correlation between everybody and everybody else. And then I will tell you clearly the coefficient number. Now, these numbers are very, very, very highly decimals. You have so many decimals in there. So, why don't you just make it all two decimals? Okay, so click on the Home tab. Home tab. And then down there, you see an arrow. Okay, just under the general, you see an arrow to the right. Click on the number. <coughs> Whilst you're looking at it, click on number. 
and everything will tend to two decimals. Watch behind the scene. Okay. Everything has now turned to two decimals. What is this? What is it that we've created? It's known as a correlation matrix. A correlation matrix is a matrix of rows and columns. That tells you the relationship between every single variable that is usually used in a regression. Okay. So that is a correlation matrix. Now let's move on. I know somebody will say, take it one more time, but don't worry. Like I indicated, okay, we have a lot. So just go through this. You'll know how I did it, okay? Because if I say I'm taking it one more time, I'm so much aware that that is going to take some kind of, somebody will still not get it, okay? Or maybe even you will still not get it. So just take your time, watch a video, and then go through it again. Then we have this, in fact, this is in your slide. If you go back and check your slides, you'll notice that I have cut and pasted everything for you. Let me just show you what I mean. Okay. So this is a slide and check. You see, I've cut and pasted it even in the slide for you to, to be able to use it. Okay. In Excel, choose data, data analysis. I tell you step by step what to do. Then I cut and paste and show you. Then I tell you step by step what to do. Then I cut and paste. Tell you step by step and all that. So at this stage, I want you to look at the correlation matrix, and I'm going to ask you some five questions. Very quick ones, okay? So look at it, okay? Do you realize that on the diagonals, on the diagonals, every number is one? Every number is one. This is known as perfect correlation. Every value is perfectly correlated with itself. Values, you know, related to itself, so they all have one, one, one. However, when you look at the values here, you will notice that some of the values have gone negative, some have gone positive, which shows that there is a negative relationship between some and a positive relationship between others. Look at this question one here, and let me ask the questions that I want to ask. Because based on the question I'll ask you, it will help you to think. Which three pairs of variables are perfectly correlated? I'll give you the first one, then you will give me the second one and third one. Which three pairs? Pair. Something and something is a pair. Which three pairs of variables are perfectly correlated? So this is Excel. Can you tell me which three pairs of variables are perfectly correlated? Who can raise a hand and tell me or type the answers there? Which three pairs of variables are perfectly correlated? Perfect. When I say they are perfectly correlated, it means they have a correlation coefficient of one. Perfectly correlated. Okay. So the variables that are perfectly correlated, I will give you the first one. And that is Q and Q. The values are one. Now, which variables are perfectly correlated? Okay. Which variables? You don't mention it as Q alone. You rather mention it as Q and Q. Okay. So in this case, you mention Q and Q. You don't mention something and you know Q Q. No, you mention Q and Q, and it's very important. So the first one that we get is Q and Q. And that is the second one. Easy peasy. So that's what we mean by perfect correlation. Now, what about the next one? Okay, so let me go to the next one and then show you. The next one is okay. Um, is the question says that which pairs of variables are most strongly correlated with the response? The response variable is the dependent variable Q. That's a response. Variable kill. Okay. And the question now is that this dependent variable, which is kill, okay, which two pairs are most correlated with it? Kill. So the response variable is kill here. Now, when you say which variables have a strong correlation with kill, it is the one with the absolute value. Okay, the one with the coefficient of highest, the highest in absolute terms, 
Forget about if it has minus or plus. In absolute terms, okay? So it will be what and what. The same way we're mentioning kill and kill. This one will be what and what. So what is it? The two variables, the two pairs, the first pair that you can think about is what? Let me see whether somebody has cracked it. The first pair is what? P and Q, P and Q. Excellent, beautiful. The first one is P and Q because the correlation coefficient there is 0.87. We have done. What's the next pair? The next pair. The next pair is what? The next pair. Okay. So the next pair of correlation um, is R, M, and Q. I'm getting some strange answers here. Okay. R, M, and Q. Now, if you look at it very carefully, you see that it is O, T, R, L, and Q. Okay. Look at it. If you don't open your eyes, you miss it. This is a value. O, T, R, which has a correlation coefficient of negative 0.78. That is the next line. And that is the, 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 the variables that are most, most correlated with the dependent variable. Okay. Any questions? Okay. You, seem, you all seem to be fine. The answers you are giving shows that you are right. Okay. So let's go to the next question. The next question says that, okay, which three pairs of variables are mostly multicollinear? Which three pairs of variables are mostly multicollinear? Now, maybe you want to write a definition of multicollinear down. Because once you have the definition in your mind, it will save you a lot of trouble. Multicollinearity occurs. Multicollinearity occurs when two independent variables you can shorten them as ivs multicollinearity occurs when two independent variables are so highly correlated that multicollinearity occurs when two independent variables are so highly correlated that it becomes difficult to disentangle it becomes difficult to disentangle the partial effect of one from the other on the dependent variable. It becomes difficult to disentangle the partial effect of one from the other on the dependent variable. So, one of the first things you should notice is that multicollinear variables must be independent variables. Okay. They've got to be independent variables. They've got to be independent. See, let me tell you why it's important that they got to be independent variables. Because when you look into the thing, okay, they are the ones that are claiming, the independent variables are always claiming that they will affect the dependent variable. So, which three pairs? Now, you know what I mean by pairs anytime I mention pairs. Which three pairs are most highly multicollinear? Now, the dependent variable column will not be part because it's, it's a dependent variable. It's not an independent variable. So every number there is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. So your, your search here will take you to this way. Okay. It's very important because sometimes it's very important that you not stab yourself. And you have to take your time and comb through it. What is the first pair of multicollinear? The first multicollinear pair. Do you see it there? Okay. Do you see the first multicollinear pair there? Okay. If you look here carefully, the first one, yes, um, is negative 0.74. Negative, sorry, no, that's not the first one. The first one is this. 0 0.76, 0 0.76. You see, that is the more reason why I say you should be careful. Yeah. Oh, you can't see the Excel. Oh, so, 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 so. Let me start again. So this is it. This is it. 
look at it we are only looking at the independent variable section okay we are looking at only this independent section. we cannot look at the, the dependent variable column the reason why we cannot look at the dependent variable column is that it includes a dependent variable but multicollinearity deals with independent variables Which one, forget about the one, 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 they are perfect. Which one is the most highly multicollinear? Tell me the number first. The number, in absolute terms, what is the number? In absolute terms, which one has the biggest number for, for, for its variables to be the first multicollinear pair? Which one? Point seven six. That's a correct answer. Okay. Point seven six. Somebody is aware of why he or she is in this room. Someone is aware. Someone too is not aware. Okay. So that is the first pair. What is the second pair? Which number will guide you to get a second pair? Which number will guide you to get a second pair? So what is the second? Pair? So the first pair is point seven six. Point seven six. So this is the first multicollinear pair. What is this, the next one? The next one. In absolute terms, okay. In absolute terms means that you have to write it and put the bar left and right, but it's not too important. You can just write. Okay, so negative point seven four. What is the last pair? What is the last pair? Yeah, the last pair. The last pair is not negative point seven four. The last pair mm, can be a little bit confusing. Right? That is negative point six two. No, that's wrong. Somebody mentioned negative point six two. This one, that's wrong. The last pair is this. The last pair. It's not 0.62. Okay. Remember, it's the whole of this side you are looking at. It's the whole of this. And the last pair, if you look at points, this one, look at that. 0.71. That is bigger than, you know, point, negative 0.762. So the last pair is 0.71. That is M and C. M and C. M and C. Oh, there is even 0.73. You're right. That's wrong. Okay, so again, it just shows that you got to be careful. That's the last pair. The last pair is negative 0.73. <laughs> I like that. Someone will say, I was just trying to see whether you can get it. So I was trying to confuse you. And you see, again, what this means is that you have to take your time and go through all of them to be sure that this is the biggest, this is the next bigger one, next bigger one, next bigger one. And then you can get it. Okay, it is point seven three. That is the last one. So the first one is point seven six. Okay, this one here, point seven six, which is O T R M P. Then followed by C and P, negative point seven four. Then followed by R M and M, negative point seven. So this is how you identify multicollinear variables, multicollinear variables, okay? Now that we've been able to establish some things about relationship, we've seen all about the relationships. We've also seen that price has a negative relationship with the rest. We are now ready to do our regression. But before we do that, let me just show you some few things you can do in correlation. And again, all of these commands are you can do this correlation now this correlation we did it in excel but sometimes depending on the situation you may want to do it in r okay sometimes you want to do it in r so what we are going to do is i'm going to go to our r studio and then we will now continue 